So with full understanding that the lunch line is long and there are some delays there, um, I want to reassure everybody that the technology here in Hannaford Hall is to, up to snuff. These are, these are recorded and they will be, um, we will, with permission, be offering these as recordings. So these, these sessions are, are high value to us. So I'd like to go ahead and uh, introduce Eric, Erica Mateo. Uh, who's been instrumental in really focusing on this connection, building the bridge, I call it, building the little bridge, uh, which we hope will get bigger and bigger and bigger between K-12 and college and career ready. So, Erica. Thank you, Jeff. All right, so thank you all for joining us. I understand that folks are trying to grab lunch, so we'll try to integrate new people into the conversation as they get here. Um, I'd like to... Um, Thank you for taking, taking your lunch break to join us for this conversation. We've titled it College and Career Readiness, Assessing Access for Opportunity. My name's Erica Mazzello, as Jeff said, and I have the honor of facilitating this conversation today. Uh, I want to thank our panelists for joining us and welcome them to introduce themselves in just a moment. Our discussion will be followed by a Q&A, so please save some uh, questions for the end. Sincere thanks to Jeff and Anita. I don't know where they've disappeared to at this point. They're always running around today. For recognizing that now is the time and this is the place to begin this conversation. Uh, we hear a lot about college and career readiness these days, but what is the definition and what demonstrates success? We're all grappling with this question. Picking up on Dr. Cummings' opening remarks, perhaps a, tu a true test of successful executive functioning is a college and career ready individual. After all, a typical student will have invested 13 years of the first 18 years of their life in their educational career. The truth we know is that learning never stops. So it makes sense to take a step back and look at the continuum of pre-K through 16 education. In order to foster this dialogue, we've assembled a panel of leaders who are doing the work. As Dr. Richard Elmore says, we learn to do the work by doing the work. I would like uh, to ask our panelists to introduce themselves at this time. I'll begin with uh, Paul Charpentier of Southern Maine Community College, please. Hi, good, good afternoon. Uh, my name's Paul Charpentier. I'm the Associate Dean of Academic Affairs at Southern Maine Community College. Hi, my name's Anna Black. I work for the state of Maine in our Department of Corrections. I oversee our strategy and grants management. So working on relationships with stakeholders, um, encouraging more advocacy, getting more folks into the prison to be stakeholders and helping uh, ensure that our folks are ready to enter back into society. Good afternoon, I'm Sandy Prince, Superintendent of Wyndham and Raymond School Department. And to my right is... I'm Paige Pandora, I'm a senior at Wyndham High School. Good afternoon, my name is Angel Martinez Loredo and I'm the Director of Higher Education and Student Support Services with the Maine Department of Education. I'm happy to be here with this distinguished panel and happy to be here with you. Sharing your lunch because I can hear it, so it makes <laughs> me hungry. <laughs> Hi, I'm Peter Diplock. I'm with the Maine Department of Labor. I'm with the Bureau of Employment Services. I oversee the Augusta and Skowhegan Career Centers. Erica also suggested I might mention that my previous job was that I worked for almost 15 years with the Division of Vocational Rehabilitation. I am a certified rehabilitation counselor as well. Yes, thank you, Peter. Good afternoon. My name is Megan Kedwallader. I'm the Director of Educational Partnerships here at University of Southern Maine. And that makes me responsible for all manner of articulation, dual enrollment, um, in-system agreements, things like that. Hi, my name is Beth Fisher. I'm the director of Midco School of Technology in Rockland. I'm also the chair of the STEM Council and the president-elect of Maine's um, Association of Career and Technical Educators. Hello, I'm Tom Seekins with Siemens Energy Environmental Services. I manage the energy environmental services for New England with Siemens and uh, a corporate partner of USM and Erica at this point. Mm -hmm. And good afternoon. My name is Heather Perry. I'm the superintendent of schools in Gorham, Maine. I'm also the chair of the uh, board at Goodwill Hinckley and also a member of the board on the Jobs for Maine's graduates. 
Thanks, everybody. So without further delay, we're going to jump in. We've got about seven questions. We'll see how far we get. We'll mix it up um, and move it along. And the goal is to ensure that everybody's voice is heard, that your agencies and your initiatives are represented, and that we have lots of time for Q&A at the end. So that's the goal. We'll see how we do. Um, the first question, uh, and I'll start this off with um, Megan, dead center. <laughs> The lines between secondary and post-secondary slash pre-career education continue to fade. What role does your organization and your work play in supporting post-secondary opportunities for learners to keep progressing? I would say, succinctly put, what I do specifically creates pathways, hopefully, in nascent stages at the moment from, from a secondary situation into the post-secondary and beyond. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a matter of charting clear uh, pathways and clear trajectories through the kind of coursework that, the, that a student needs to encounter. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Heather, I know your uh, school department does a lot of work with USM. How does that look in practice in the K-12 districts? Well, uh, one of the partners, uh, USM has been a great partner in Gorham for many years. Uh, this, this past uh, year, we actually had a couple of really significant uh, additions to our partnership. One was uh, we entered into a bridge year program where our students were able to take um, um, dual enrollment courses uh, taught on-site at Guam High School and received USM credit, which was really beneficial. We also happen to have uh, a, a principal at the high school that works very closely with USM, and he's actually arranged through the changes in the schedules that we've made at the high school to have a period at the end of the day uh, between 1 o'clock and 2 o'clock, which is our, our mm. last period of the day, whereby our students can actually walk up to the Gorham campus uh, and actually participate in courses on the, on the Gorham campus at USM and uh, be fully engaged in the coursework uh, and those kinds of things. Um, we also have lots of different, I mean, I could probably talk for hours on that, which I'm not going to, but that's just a couple of examples of our partnership Thank with USM. You. That's great. Um, so, Paul and others, uh, there are many paths to a person's direction in continuing their educational career. Um, there's no single trajectory, and it's usually not a straight path. Um, and so people plot their course independently, and this lands um, in different places. So perhaps after high school, they initiate a, a post-secondary career at SMCC, for example. How do you coordinate then with the sending district and the potentially continuing post-secondary education provider? Well, there are many paths, as, you, as you've just said. Um, Increasingly, we're doing a lot of more dual enrollment courses. Um, so in articulation agreements where students are getting some college credit when they're already in high school, um, the studies on this and, and prior learning assessment, people who've been in the workforce and, and learn things that give credit for, for college, those students are much more successful when they come to us, when they've started on that path already and we can lay it out. But it's not just coming to, to take college courses. We may start a student out in some non-credit areas. For instance, uh, two years ago, we suspended our building construction program uh, because no one was graduating from it. There were, you know, there wasn't a need. Mm. So what we had to do was change we still have the program, but we modularized the curriculum so students could come and take a few non-credit courses, adds up to eight credits of what the industry is saying, these are the skills we want for somebody just coming in and things. So they can come in and learn, you know, safety, leveling, you know, basic framing and get a job. Mm -hmm. Later on, that can be turned into a certificate mm -hmm. of 30 credits. You know, they already have eight credits in there. They're part way there. Then that can be turned into a degree. Okay, so, and then maybe that degree transfers to another institution and they look at management of construction. So the pathways are not straight 
they're not, um, you know, semester to semester, you know, in, in four semesters, they're going to complete mm -hmm. something. They may take years, mm -hmm. but to be able to come back and do that. So Paul's referring to also a collection of competencies that are determined by a job on the other side, a workforce demand. Um, and sometimes these are taking unique entry points. Uh, the programs, the educational programs at with Maine Department of Corrections are very extensive. I don't know if anybody has had the opportunity to learn more about the activity uh, with the DOC educational programs, but there's an oppressive array of work going on. Can you tell us a little bit more both about the, the non-credit and the emerging for-credit opportunities that the incarcerated population are having access to in Maine DOC facilities? Absolutely. So the Department of Corrections, our mission really is to rehabilitate. We would like folks come in to get as much support and help as they need. Um, we offer mental health, substance abuse, plenty of education, vocation opportunities. Um, so in regards to education, offenders can get high set, they can finish their high school work, they can go on to post-secondary education. Um, there are many of whom are working on master's degrees. There's associate's degrees, there's a sort of an array of opportunities in the traditional educational sense. Um, in our vocational programming, which is somewhat separate, though it overlaps in many ways, offenders have the opportunity to learn trades, just like Paul was referring to, um, working towards certificates so that as they come back into society, they have the skill set, they have the certification, and they can work that directly into employment. Mm -hmm. um, for teachers looking at how the education system and corrections work, it probably works very similar to what you're experiencing, what many of our panelists do, and what many of you do in your day-to-day -day lives. Um, offenders are studying, they're working towards degrees, they're working towards completion of high school, um, and this is an important opportunity for them to sort of help stay on the right path um, reduces the rate of recidivism, and it also gives them the opportunity to connect with SMCC or KVCC or any of our other institutions in Maine, which as a department um, and as a state agency, we would like as many folks as possible to go back into these organizations. Um, we want them to be at SMCC. We want them to come to UMA, or to UM, uh, USM, excuse me. <laughs> All of the UMs. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity to overlap and collaborate, and that's definitely a big priority of our department right now, um, which is what we've been working on yeah. with Paul and with Erica as well. Thanks, Anna. So we talk a lot about workforce. We have a workforce representative here on the panel. Uh, Tom Seekins is with Siemens Corporation, and whether you know it or not, they're probably present in your uh, school district or municipality. I believe it's over 80% of the schools and municipalities in the state of Maine. Uh, have Siemens working with them. They're an incredible partner um, in educational uh, endeavors as well as all things engineering. Um, so from the workforce perspective, you could potentially speak to what it is that you need from an educated person and someone who's willing to continue their learning. Yeah, it's been fun. This past year I interviewed a bunch of um, interns from USM actually, and we've been increasing our female engineering workforce. Um, I've been with Siemens for 14 years and we've probably out of the past five years, I bet you 90% of the people we've hired have been female engineering students or recent graduates, which has been a really cool turn in the business. Um, they're way smarter than the guys are that we've experienced, um, which is not good for us. But uh, I interviewed six students from USM this past summer to help out with a project we were doing a, um, we're engineering an energy reduction project in Rockland, Maine, actually. It's a large project. We needed some, some summer support and interviewed six or seven, one female, and light years ahead of um, most of what we heard. And yeah, she got, got the internship, and then we hired her right after. She just actually had her first full day yesterday as a full-time employee. So the skill set from USM was economics. Um, with She had gotten her LEED certification, so she had an interest in energy but got into it and figured out she was really good at CAD. She had been taking some CAD classes. So when you look at what engineering is, um, we go and speak to uh, high schools and middle schools all the time. We do STEM programs. Mm -hmm. We're about to do uh, our first USM-sponsored engineering summer camp, um, all built around the STEM-based learning curriculum. So we're actually looking at donating some money so that we can keep continuing to build, build these programs to get incentivize kids to want to go into engineering. Because 
you talk to kids sometimes about what engineering is, and we have uh, Carrie Worms, one of our recent ma mass maritime engineering um, partners. She's now with Siemens, and we say, who here thinks that either myself, Carrie, or two others are an engineer? And no one raised their hand with Carrie. And she was the, the prominent engineer on the panel. So we want to change that whole dynamic. And so that's what we're looking for is just, you know, open up your mind to what engineering could be. 90% of our company are engineers, are either energy engineer, mechanical engineer, electrical engineer. It doesn't really matter what it is. So it's been a lot of fun. Thanks, Tom. So, Angel, from the perspective of the Maine Department of Education, speaking to public-private partnership in the educational endeavors to support Maine's workforce, how does that look from your agency's work in terms of um, supporting the post-secondary attainment and uh, the integration with the public-private partnership? I think it's very significant, very important that we're looking at uh, as far as the department wanting to expand that a little bit more. But I think the other dimension to look at is the actual student. I think we've been talking about the different processes and how we can get the student to come from your school to uh, a four-year school and then finish up. I think to understand is maybe the profile of the student today is what we're looking at in the department. Mm -hmm. And that's basically that the student we have today is a consumer. And so this individual is looking for an opportunity that is within their purse range, mm -hmm. that's within their idea. Secondly, they're looking for an experience that will provide some type of a opportunity of trade, opportunity of, a, of a work knowledge upon graduation. And what they're not looking for sometimes in, in higher ed, sometimes we, we feel bad about this, they're not looking for that Aristotelian you know, uh, uh, type of experience where they you know, hang on every word of the professor. That's gone. I mean, the, the student's looking at a quality education that's rigorous, that's academically focused, but it's affordable, and that it will enable them to jump into the workforce and to be able to, to pay off the debt that they've incurred. And I think that's the other aspect of it, and we'll probably be talking about it a little bit more, but I think it's that aspect of debt. And then sometimes when we're looking at students who are non-traditional, they're already coming to our campuses with debt. And so how can we educate them better to be able to finish and to move forward with uh, an opportunity that will allow them to, to, to uh, pay for their debt, but also to experience life. And I think that's mm. very significant. So we're trying to partner as, as much as possible with different folks in the industry. And then at the same time, trying to help uh, the higher ed uh, school, the higher ed departments, uh, the, the, the colleges and universities to do the same thing, to be able to have a seamless uh, opportunity. It's a great uh, thing to strive for, but sometimes it's, it doesn't get there. Yeah. So we have an actual student on our panel, Paige. Um, and Paige, I'm wondering, from your perspective, sitting at the cusp of graduation, high school graduation, do you see the continuum? Do you see the work before and potentially going forward? How does it look from your perspective? It looks like Pretty scary, to <laughs> honestly. Um, trying to like step from a high school where you're sort of just isolated into this four years of like s just schedule. You have blocks every day. It's sort of like a routine, and then working like towards getting into a workplace. It's just so like different. Um, um, I think that senior year, as like I'm getting ready to graduate, it's sort of like there was a college fair at our school like a week ago, and it's sort of like all these businesses are coming to you, like trying to get to you to apply, and it's just everything's like right at the end, and mm. <laughs> mm -hmm. all your final decisions are about to be made. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Paige. So, and it doesn't. We know it will be what's next. Um, and Peter works closely with populations who are integrating and reintegrating and um, retraining and recognizing what, uh, what is needed uh, before it is maybe defined. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what your agency does to support learners in their continuum? Sure. I'll try to anyways. Uh, <laughs> Career centers are a little different depending on which career center you go to. Mm -hmm. So I always try to say to folks, we're really not the same animal depending on which center you go into. But essentially, our job is to work with adults and with young people to um, really help them identify what barriers uh, might exist 
uh, and then work with them towards developing an employment plan that, that often includes uh, post-secondary uh, post education, things of that nature. But, you know, each of the career centers should have a youth consultant that works there. Um, typically, we support young people in a number of different avenues working towards that post-secondary goal. It may be an on-the-job training sort of scenario, a work experience, really heavily emphasized now under many of the grants that we work with. We um, help support many of the programs you've talked about under the Competitive Skills Scholarship Bridge Program, which again mm -hmm. provides some of the funding for some of the youth that are, are really bridging that avenue and, and uh, obtaining credits prior to graduation. Uh, we also um, work uh, with a number of, of internal partners, uh, whether that be vocational rehabilitation, with the local workforce investment boards, with the employers in the community, and really that's our hope is to be able to make a real connection um, to the jobs in the community with the young people that we're working with, and, and so making sure that the goal is, is achievable, realistic, things of that nature, and helping support them in, in a number of ways, but financial is certainly a big part of it. So. Thanks, thanks. Okay, I'm gonna skip to question three. Uh, we might come back to question two. It's all about assessment. We'll get there. Um, so uh, the question, I'll, I'll present it to Sandy first, please. Uh, in your opinion, what is the single most significant barrier for students in accessing post-secondary coursework? That's a good question. Um, we've had, I think this last year, 62 students going to USM, and it's been a great experience. But sometimes the schedules do not allow to line up perfectly. Mm -hmm. So that's one obstacle. I think the other one, transportation from Wyndham High School to USM, it takes a little bit of a ride. Um, so that transportation has been a, somewhat of a, a struggle. But overall, it's been an excellent experience for those 62 students because, in fact, what they are receiving is the college writing course at USM that um, is, gives them credit and, and again, they don't have to take the uh, English class uh, their senior year at, high, at Wyndham High School. So it's been a great experience. Thank you so much. And I'll bounce this next, please, to Beth Fisher, Midcoast School of Technology, because of the uh, work that she's doing to support her students in the same way. What are uh, some of the most significant barriers you see students facing in accessing post-secondary coursework? Well, I think the biggest problem is communication between systems. So. Um, a lot of times we're so busy doing what we do that we're not working closely enough with both our sending school partners and with our higher ed partners so that everybody understands what learning the students have and so that we can collectively support their move um, into the next phase. I think there's a lot of misunderstanding. All the talk that we're having this morning about how many students are getting college credits um, in high school, I think a lot of people in the state still don't understand that. And that's happening in the career and tech schools as well as in the high schools. Mm -hmm. And I went to a celebration last Saturday um, of the main career and tech students. And it was amazing what these students were doing. And some of them had at least 30 college credits already when they were graduating from high school in a few weeks. So um, a lot of people don't know that work is out there. And um, I think we need to do a better job of having that work be transparent and replicated um, to follow the models that are successful around the state. Thanks. So Paige, if there were no barriers to accessing post-secondary, uh, what would that look like? What would be your first jump in? I would probably travel to a different state to go to college. If finance and um, uh, cultural mm -hmm. barriers or um, differences weren't really there, I'd probably okay. go to California or something. <laughs> All right. um, uh, finance, I think, is honestly one of the biggest barriers for college or high school to college kids, especially because we don't really have a grasp of how much debt we'll, we will acquire. Mm -hmm. Personal finance really isn't taught mm -hmm. too much in high school. Mm -hmm. So this knowledge yeah. of personal yeah. finance. I can totally relate, having been the first member of my family to graduate from college. It's very intimidating, um, and I think that's a very real concern. I think maybe there are some assumptions on the receiving side that all of that conversation has been had, um, but it is, still, it is still a significant barrier, perceived or real. Um, so maybe you could share a little bit about what you do in Gorham to support students as they are approaching uh, the challenge of 
accessing post-secondary coursework? Certainly, I, I would like to, I can address those things. I also wanted to add, uh, add one piece about a, a particular barrier, but I'll address barrier. that particular mm -hmm. question first, um, which, you know, some of the things that we do in Gorm, we do offer a financial literacy course for students, and I know many of our area school systems actually do do that now. It's, it's certainly something that has grown in our curriculums over the past few years because of the issue of uh, debt and making sure that students understand that. Uh, we also offer programs. I know many schools, for example, offer Jobs for Means graduates programs as a primary example. Uh, that program is uh, geared towards uh, helping students um, be successful to enter directly f either from the high school into their careers or from the high school into a post-secondary experience. And there's many actually Jobs for Maine's graduates programs at the university level now, which are specifically geared to helping students transition from that high school experience to the post-secondary. So that's just a couple of examples. A barrier I wanted to add to that particular piece is, um, is a barrier of perception, I think. And I think it's a barrier of perception uh, from our, our, our professionals, actually, as, as high school teachers um, around what, uh, what is necessary for post-secondary experiences. And I think there's been such a drive over the past several years around it's got to be a four-year college, it's got to be a four-year college that, that our students and the parents are really, that they kind of build that culture around that's the only expectation where I really think that, um, that there's all kinds of different experiences we can talk about that students can be successful. We talked about the multiple pathways. Um, and I think that uh, one thing that we can do to help with that is to, uh, is to showcase for our teachers what those opportunities are. And I know that in Gorham, just a few weeks ago, and I, I have some Gorham folks here, uh, they can attest to that. Uh, we did a business tour with our high school teachers. Mm -hmm. And they toured uh, four different area businesses and spoke with those businesses, uh, got to see their facilities, got to go behind the scenes and the creation of things, and got to uh, hear from the, from the business owners and the workers in those areas what those skills are that are so important for students to leave our schools with. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it really helped to change a little bit of the focus and the perception around what it is we need to have our schools, our, our students leaving our schools with mm -hmm. the skills. So. That's a really good point. We've been talking a lot about that in higher ed, the soft skills, the definition. Um, Paul, could you tell us a little bit more about the barriers that you see students facing as they access post-secondary coursework? Um, one of the barriers we see, over 50% of the students that come to SMCC need some type of developmental coursework, um, usually in math. And this is not a main problem. This is a national um, issue. And how do we support those students and get them through? Because, you know, uh, for instance, the engineering programs here at, at USM, you have to be calculus ready, really, to enter an engineering program. We, take, we have an engineering program where we take them, you know, to get them ready for calculus. And then we have transfer agreements that they'd come here after two, two years or or more, depending on where they start in the math sequence. And they come here and enter engineering and become engineers. Um, other things we're working on is how can we shorten this sequence nationally? Mm -hmm. People are looking at, you know, taking people from, you know, pre-algebra to, to college-level math in one year. We're currently working, a group at our college is gonna be in Minnesota next week at a, a conference that are working on a national agenda to do that sequence in one year. So that'll get more students through. We do math boot camps in the summer to, to get them. I'm sure you know, most places are, are doing that now. But it's, it's really a struggle to, to get them ready. So Paul segued into another uh, point in our discussion that was, um, we know that travel, uh, learners are traveling independently on this pre-K through 16 continuum. It's a completely distinct path to the individual learner. Um, and sometimes we have to support them backwards, so to speak. We need to access what would, be, what would have been assumed to have been uh, successful prior learning. Um, and we are looking at this continuum uh, in order to know where to begin to advance the learner forward. Uh, can some, would somebody on the panel like to speak to what challenges you see learners facing in their readiness to access higher education slash be truly workforce ready? Beth. Well, we um, serve a lot of post-grads at our 
tech center, so we have a lot of young people who are maybe not ready for that next step. So on a space available, they can come and access our school for another year or two to be able to either gain a certificate or get more of the math or whatever it is that they need to be successful. We also partner with our adult ed um, to provide a lot of those remedial courses so that those we have readily accessible at a very low cost for our adults to take those math classes or those mm -hmm. literacy classes to prepare them to be mm -hmm. successful in higher ed. Support, support, support. Um, Ankel, can you tell us a little bit about what your agency is doing to recognize this need for support and embed it in the published opportunities, the pathways that are you know, offered in um, publication and practice of those admissions offices and guidance referral offices? Uh, before I put that to answer, I just wanted to follow up the, the sites uh, where we're talking about other opportunities for, for students. And in particularly my area, I license close to 100 uh, proprietary schools. Mm -hmm. And these are schools that are not degree, uh, they don't deliver degrees, but what they do, they give certificates. And these uh, proprietary uh, agencies range from, uh, uh, I have one that, that teaches students how to do midwifery, all the way to another one that does how to fly a uh, plane, to be pilots licensed, to be sailors, to different things that they do. And for that, I don't say small niche, but a growing niche of individuals that choose that pathway, and they're very successful. And these are courses that range from six weeks to three months uh, to sometimes six months, and then they finish with their certificate, they go into industry, and they do really well. So it's one side. Now, as far as the development, what we're doing with some of the other uh, or universities is that we will consult with them and try to provide some of their current literature. A lot of times they have that already of things that they're doing. And so we try to provide uh, some opportunities for them to uh, experience, to provide more experience of what they want to do in those agencies. In particular, I spend a lot of time uh, traveling through the, a lot of the humane system uh, um, universities and discussing and talking how we can uh, work better with the student. Mm -hmm. The other side, I think, all we try to do is to give a different side as far as the demographics of the student. We talked about that the consumer being the student being a consumer, but also looking that the student is very diverse. That the students in Maine, well, we think Maine is, 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 is looks different. It's, it's diversity is hitting Maine. And so we have a profile of students who are more diverse. They speak several languages. They have a different background experience and they see uh, university life very differently. And a lot of them, like you and me, were first generation college student attendees. So these individuals mm -hmm. have a different set of needs, and we try to work with the universities to say, look at these needs. And a lot of them already are doing a lot of mm -hmm. those type of things. So there's a lot of great literature out there, particularly in California, Texas, where there is a big number of first generation uh, college students. But here we try to do the same mm -hmm. and, and breach that out with, with, with the universities. Thanks. Um, I wanted to ask Tom this question as well, because we know that once folks enter the workforce, it's not over. The learning continues. And um, maybe it's a sensitive question, not sure, but do they ever have to be retrained on skills that you would have assumed that they would have had entering into your company? Oh, yeah, big time. You're looking at one right here. <laughs> I had to go to Chicago for two years to relearn how to do calculations with letters in them. So. Um, but the, the, the other side of this is, uh, yeah, it's retraining, but I was talking about the vocational students and how that whole dynamic has changed a lot. Um, when a long time ago, as a vote, kids were basically auto mechanics, right? That was the whole, basically the thought process of what vocational school or kids were. And now it's changed into, we look for vocational kids from the engineering world. And it doesn't mean that you have to be good at math. Um, we have a lot of engineers that are really bad at English, so which which was more important, right? Um, but you have a skill set based on energy management controls, uh, mechanical aptitude, boilers, pressure, steam, things like that. There's all kinds of different engineering, and I think now students are more and more aware of that. So if you're a vocational student and you love energy reduction or renewable energy or the mechanical side of the world. There's companies like ours everywhere that are looking for people every day. Um, and we don't really look for someone that has a mechanical engineering degree or a bachelor's degree. What's your background and, and how does that apply to what we do? So it um, doesn't matter where, what degree you have, 
you're probably going to be retrained at some point anyway. So. That's interesting. Yeah. Does anybody else have anything they'd like to add to this point in the conversation? Um, just touching on, on the relationships with outside organizations, you know, making sure that we are all connecting with one another so that our Department of Corrections, we are working regularly with our Department of Labor, with our Department of Education, with our businesses in the community, that the only way that from the Department of Corrections standpoint, that we can ensure um, folks are getting the quality education that they need, getting the vocational training that they need and that they want, um, is if we have strong connections and partnerships in place. Um, that's happening at the college level, but it's also happening at other agencies. And that's a big part of um, ensuring the pathway that's, that's an important piece. So I'm hearing a lot about awareness and collaboration and communication. Megan, can you speak a little bit to some of the critical points in terms of uh, collaboration that support learners in accessing higher education, higher educational opportunities here at USM? Critical points? In collaboration, <laughs> yeah. I would say one of the things that we have to take our our instruction from is what is the workplace asking for? And not just soft skills, hard skills, et cetera, but what is the demand in terms of the market showing us? And where do we start first? And because we could, we could connect many different kinds of programs, but and we need to respond to the, the most critical things first. So I think doing the proper research to know what is that demand is one of the, the crucial starting points that we find is sometimes difficult because there can be campus excitement um, for a particular program that has started or has been around for a while but then uh, wants to increase its, its width or breadth and maybe that's not the area that's actually meeting any kind of public need. So I would say that that's a, a critical piece on the front end. So Sandy, I'd like to ask you, so how closely do superintendents have access or are tracking on the issues of workforce demand, uh, how, how aware are you of those immediate on-time um, changes and evolutions in what is college and career ready from the perspective of the, those of us who are preparing students for that? Well, we're fortunate. We have a career counselor that focuses just on students like Paige, and Paige has not been at Wyndham High School this year. She's a senior, but she's been off campus. And so that counselor really has helped inform me of all the good work that's going on with students in the workforce. Um, internships, Paige has been involved with a finance internship this year. Um, so I, I think really through JMG, the work that that mm -hmm. career counselor has Jobs provided. Jobs for main grads. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really been uh, fundamental yeah. to our work. Excellent, thanks. So we're short on time. I'm going to ask uh, one more question, I think, and then I'll leave it up for some q and A. I I think we've got some, uh, some interest out there. Um, in a few words, what do you think needs to change to improve learner access and successful completion of programs um, to strengthen learner opportunities? What changes need to happen to further strengthen these ties and opportunities? Sure. Thanks, Heather, for the suggestion. <laughs> Not a problem. Uh, just really quickly, from my perspective, the biggest piece is, is um, strengthening communication between uh, pre-K to 12 and then the, 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 the 16 continuum uh, between those things. Um, there's been great co communication and collaboration. I think that more is needed, uh, and I think that that continued conversation is, is very important. Um, so that's mine. You don't have to. Um, I think, uh, you know, the communication piece is really critical and um, letting um, our students know that whatever pathway they choose is valid. Mm -hmm. So not um, giving the message to students that, like we said before, that, higher, that four years of higher ed is the only way to be successful. Mm -hmm. um, we need to let all students know that what they do, um, if they do it well, is a valuable contribution to our society. And we need to support them in that. So to me, our education system has got to constantly ask the question, what do the students need and what does industry need and not what does the institution need? Mm. I would say to that end, what we, we also aren't necessarily aware of, we spoke to the nonlinear pathways that, that students take, so if a student achieves a two-year degree and then takes some time, we're then having to re-engage with a different population. And I don't know that we 
we necessarily are very aware of that at all points, that how those students change as time and their concerns change as time goes on and that we need to be engaging with them in different ways across that continuum. Sure. Um, actually, I mean, I, I echo much of what you said. I, I think industry really has to be better connected, if you will, to education. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly, we're doing a lot more employer-driven work now. And what we're finding from employers is that we haven't always done a very good job of really meeting their needs. Um, and that they're having to seek outside of Maine uh, yeah. to fill their needs. So that's kind of scary for us. And I'm yeah. sure it's scary for you, too. Um, so really, that, that to me was probably the biggest point mm -hmm. I'd like to make. I think for me, um, one thing I would say is to be able to use our resources. And I think from the K through 12, one thing that's very important to look at is that 11th grade assessment. And once a student takes that 11th grade assessment to see how, where they fit, I mean, where they fall in the results, but at the same time to have a conversation with that student to see what is their career track. Where do they want to go? If it's like going to secondary, if it's going to a CTE education, or if it's doing more work to prepare for the four-year career. But I think that the industry discussion should be done really early, and I think it should be between the fifth and sixth grades and even yeah. middle school of where the student wants to go. I think very, very, it's, that's significant. So I would recommend those type of things. And as for, and for folks in higher ed, I said us in higher ed because I consider, still consider myself a part of higher ed, is to see how higher ed can connect to that middle school to the elementary school and provide some type of access to the student and be able to change based on those trends that they're experiencing. Thank you. Um, Paige. From a high school point of view, I believe that junior and senior year should be more personalized to the student because we have a lot of our gen ed classes, the like core classes. Of course, we also take math, English, history, science. But by junior and senior year, I believe electives should be more based around what you think you want to do. Say, like, when I was ju a junior, I wanted to be a dentist, but I have no interest in dentistry now. <laughs> um, just sort of, like, giving electives that are more work-based instead of, like, um, um, sort of, like, we have a lot of arts. Of course, people love art, but I'm not, I'm not an artist. I'm more into finance and uh, math and oriented like that. Thanks. So in the perfect world, I would love to be able to look at every kindergarten parent and say that your child in our district will have the ability to have three college credits if they choose to do that before they graduate. I'd love to get awesome. to that day when I can do that. Thanks. So in a few words, I think the reduction of stigma, um, the stigma associated with one just going into higher ed that can be very difficult for many folks, especially in Maine, um, with our generational poverty, with all sorts of different issues happening. Um, but with our correction population, reducing the stigma that's associated with higher ed and having folks from incarceration, um, folks with felony records coming into our school systems, and also with our, our business partners. Um, the less stigma there is associated with our business partners, hiring folks with felony records, the easier it is going to be for the pathway in incarceration to be education focused. Yeah. And I wanted to say it's been an honor to work with the Department of Corrections and learn more about what the incarcerated potential employee can do to uh, satisfy the needs of our workforce in Maine. It's been quite fascinating. Paul. I hated school. And I, I was that voc kid who, you know, did a vocational high school, hated school. I was going to go to a vocational college, two years, never go back to school again. <laughs> uh -huh. um, so uh, opportunities and different pathways out there that I think we only get through the collaboration of the different agencies represented here is one of the keys to providing chances for our students that they don't know necessarily at the you know 10th grade 12th grade 16th grade what they're going to be doing later on but having opportunities out there for them uh, is key Thanks, everybody. So I've genuinely failed at the assessment of having gotten to the Q&A portion of this panel. Um, is there anybody with a burning question on this topic who would like to address that now? 
before we before we well, uh, thank our panelists and welcome the next. No, anybody? Seriously? Okay. Um, all right. So all of the resources uh, to support these areas of work are in your conference files. Um, there's also a roster of the participants. And I wanted to thank everyone for joining us today. We hope that this is the beginning of a much larger conversation. And uh, the time is now. And here's the place. And thanks for being here. And um, enjoy the rest of the conference, everyone. Thanks. Group shot? Sure. Can we do a group shot? We have a photographer. Can we do a group shot? You love it. <laughs>